different aspect of care that I want to come into. And just before uh, we had the news headlines, I said that the man with whom we're going to speak now, well, his colleagues were, and I know literally it's literary abuse, but it was a matter of life or death with the work they did every day. I speak of Garrett Emerson, who until just two days ago was the chief executive of the London Ambulance Service, and I need to declare that I've known Garrett for many years because we first came across each other and you first used to come to the studios when you were a senior executive at TFL, Chief Operating Officer for Surface Transport. That's so, right, yes. Yeah, so you've had big, major uh, posts in London. You've been with the TFL, you've been with the London Ambulance Service, you've now left. Presumably, you're the new manager of Arsenal. Is that why, <laughs> is that why uh, you're leaving? I, well, I couldn't say, Nick, you know, <laughs> you but, you know, that, uh, that, uh, that, that would be an interesting thing. But why, time, why have you left? Um, well, you know, I, I, I went to the Ambulance Service uh, what, four years ago to do a very specific job, which, you know, it was in particular crisis at the time with special measures uh, shortage of staff and, uh, and and a lot of stuff that needed fixing and sorting uh, and you know we, we got on with that job we got the organization out of special measures we got the uh, the service fully fully staffed from having about 15 percent vacancies and so on uh, and then of course you know global pandemic hit and we were into a whole new challenge and the last two years have been really totally full on um, and uh, but I suppose ultimately you know you've got to sort of say when when when's the job done and for me the job felt like it was done uh we're coming you know the pandemic's still with us it's going to be with us clearly for a long time but uh the health service has now evolved and reinvented itself to deal with that uh and it's probably just now time for somebody new to step in and take that on to the next level so it was your decision yeah i think so you know i've been as you've just on, pointed out I've been, I, I think so was i've been it your doing decision? this for a lot for a long time you know uh and you know I, I went straight out of the firing pan into the fire in terms of you know going from tfl and you know you know all the, the challenges we have yes. there everything the Olympics to you know uh, traffic congestion and uh, and all the things that are still issues today so it just uh, feels to me like I a, I need a bit of time for a break I need to dedicate some time to my family that have been denied them for the last couple of years uh, and uh, and start to think about what I might do next don't quite know what that is but I know I still have a passion for this city I've got hopefully a lot of experience across yes. the public sector health transport yes. emergency services uh, and hopefully there'll be there'll be a role for me somewhere in the future somewhere Garrett um you mentioned the pandemic. You mm. kindly came in, you may recall, almost at the start of it, really, of, of the last year. You may recall it was around April time you came yeah. by. Um, at the absolute peak, uh, how thinly was it stretched? How tight was how thin was the rubber band to keep the blokes and women driving around in the ambulances and the motorbikes? Well, I think, you know, it was it was an incredible time. And I, I should start by just, you know, paying tribute to everybody on the front line, whether in, in, in ambulances or in control centres, call centres, in 111 and 999 support functions. Everybody went the extra mile and then some, and it was a really tough time. But of course, the pandemic, when it came to the UK, it came to London first. Uh, and because of the city and the, the density of our population, it spread very rapidly. Um, and because of the nature of what we did, you know, we were right at the front end. It takes time to fill hospitals up, and you know, the, the race against time within the wider system was to get capacity in the hospitals. But we were there on day one, so we had to we had to expand our capacity radically almost overnight putting you know any, anywhere near to two to three hundred more ambulances out on the roads potentially uh, taking on a thousand extra staff from volunteers to students to retired uh, uh, paramedics coming back did to, you have firefighters as well we had firefighters we had you know we, we, that was a call to andy Rowe, the, the chief fire commissioner say you know can you help you know yeah. we, we talk about you know blue light collaboration and politicians spend a lot of time talking to all of us about uh, you know how we can do more and better but of course what really showed during that time was the level of collaboration that we had not only with the firefighters but also with the metropolitan police that came in and supported us and the wider you know public sector the wider private sector tfo helped us um you know the the aa for instance you know we needed mechanics to keep our vehicles on the road 24 7 because normally we 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 repair our, our vehicles through the day and you know yes, to run overnight but the only way we could get more ambulances out was to run the wheels off them literally uh, and that needed mechanics so um and all of us so the aa stepped up and supplied yeah, blokes the, and women the, to fix them yeah um so it was it was a you know it really felt like a sort of almost you know you were part of a national effort uh, and people just went the extra mile, you know. We, we found up airline companies and said, you know, ha have you got furloughed customer services staff, clinical staff that could help us? They came and worked in 111 centres to answer calls and support 999 call handlers. We built a, an additional call centre in over a weekend, effectively, converting what was our finance department into a call centre. At Waterloo. At like Waterloo, yeah. yeah. Um, and brought in second-year paramedic students who were already partly clinically trained uh, and could very quickly be trained to answer COVID calls. 
uh, and wow. raise our capacity because the calls were going through the roof, the demand was going through the roof. So it was a real race against time, and you really felt like you know you, you hear those stories about incredible things that happened during the war, and you know yes, how do they absolutely. ever do these things so quickly? Uh, I think you know we learned how people do those things when you're in a in a national emergency. Well, it was the COVID things spirit, become wasn't possibly it wasn't the blitz spirit. Yeah, it was the COVID it was spirit. That's a good way to describe it. Did, did, did you ever think? We're not going to make it. I'm not going to got. I've not got enough blokes and women. I'm not going to get those ambulances. Those motorbikes will never be fixed. Did you ever think? Oh. Truthfully, there wasn't time to think like that. You know. Uh, you know. You just. You just went at it literally seven days a week for you know two three months until, until you got it sorted. So you didn't see your family for se- for probably pretty just much. Yeah, I, I kind of got the odd day, the Sunday afternoon home type thing. But I, you know, phone yeah, living, living permanently. Like we, we, you know, we reshaped the whole management structure uh, of the organization so that we could run seven days a week 24 7 we stripped it down we duplicated every post i worked turn you know shift in shift out with my chief operating officer similar things that we did during the olympics at tfl actually to enable a big organization to just focus on one thing and one thing alone it's a it's a, it, it's a fantastic thing to be a part of uh, and i think you know those of those of us who hadn't done that and i hadn't done that certainly before the olympics wouldn't wouldn't have said it was possible but you know what's possible when 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 you push when you focus on yeah. one thing. When we spoke last time, which was early in the pandemic, you'd already lost three of your colleagues to COVID. Mm. Do you have a number for how many people you lost? I I I wouldn't be able to give you an accurate number. I think you know for me, last year was marked not only by um, the numbers of people in the organisation that we lost to COVID, but actually we lost a, a number of very long-serving members of staff, very well-known members of staff, to other causes. It was a it was a tragic year in many, many ways. So, yes, COVID was a factor in that. Um, but it wasn't only about frontline paramedics. We lost people from our logistics teams, our, you know, uh, you know, our back office support. Um, and I think, you know, I think most people in the country know somebody who's been affected by COVID, yeah. um, you know, whether, whether it's a death or whether it's people who've been seriously ill in hospital. I know members of my family have as well. Um, and it just causes you to, to, to reevaluate the, the way you live your life and what you do. Um, and for us in the job we did, you know, it was, <laughs> whereas most of the country was going around, you know, learning to live life differently and work in a different way. We were, we were just, twice as busy yes. working twice as hard um and you know the 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 spirit i think of of the teams and and the crews and what they've done uh, has been incredible but of course there's a long-term exhaustion factor there and i think yeah. there's a long-term exhaustion factor across the whole health service that you know it's been a, a huge effort and you know we've got to focus on how we keep supporting mm. people you know one of the first things we did was you know redouble our efforts on staff welfare do everything we can from very simple things like making sure that we had tea trucks out on the road that could give people a, a hot drink and stuff like that as, as cafes and restaurants were closing down everywhere so you had LAST yeah, trucks did you yeah. know yeah our st- you know our staff working nights just still needed somewhere to get a cup of coffee and a sandwich cool. things like that through yeah. to, to much more sort of you know complex support I'm, I'm going to press one last time do, do you imagine and I appreciate you're talking about the whole of the LAS but the, the what I'm going to call the front facing the the paramedics the ambulance drivers the number of fatalities would be in the scores no 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 it's uh, it was single figures um, uh, i mean we're you know we're an organization of eight we searched about nine thousand people really um and you know uh, not everyone working full-time but lots okay. of people um and actually it was one of our fears was that you know that would be higher yes. but, you know we had access to ppe there were times when it was difficult there was a lot of issues about what type of ppe was the right you know protective yeah. equipment but we never ran out you know that was one of the other big challenges how do we get you know we got a million pieces of ppe to our front line within six weeks okay um, how long were you in your stint, Garrett, when the Grenfell tragedy took place? About 11 days, I think. What's um, your recollection of that? Uh, that was, I mean, I think that's one of those days that will stick with me to the rest of my life. You know, I was there, uh, not in the morning, but in the afternoon on that day. Uh, and just the the atmosphere, you know, I've, you know, I've never been, most of us have ne- never went to Ground Zero when Twin Towers fell. But... If there was ever a place where you felt like this is what it must have been like, just the the atmosphere of tragedy uh, uh, and you know the, the 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 faces and the feeling on the part of the community uh, and in part of the, the the emergency services, you know, all 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 three services were there in numbers, and, and and for us tragically, you know, there wasn't a great deal that we had to do because there weren't that many survivors coming out, and 
Uh, and that was really frustrating. You know, was two weeks before or a week before we'd been at London Bridge, uh, and that was you know three four days into my mm. stint as, uh, when the terror attack happened there. And although again, you know, tragically, eight people lost their lives there, we took forty eight people to hospital, and all of them survived. Uh, and that's something that I know we were really and are really proud of. You're still affected by Grenfell. I think so. I mean, I think, I think, you know, the, the effect of that summer. Uh, the, the 2017, everybody remembers Grenfell, everybody remembers yes. London Bridge, but there was also Westminster. There were also a number of other attacks that were less uh, uh, less uh, scale, places like Parsons Green, yes, Finsbury the, Park, the tube, that the, were equally the horrific. That started to yeah, burn, yeah, we had a thousand staff that had been <laughs> impacted and been involved in one or other of those incidents. So it was a big exercise to make sure we looked after the welfare of people. Uh, right across the organisation, because the effects of these things can be very long term. Okay. Last couple of questions. I mustn't hold you up. Um, yeah. Did you mandate that your colleagues, particularly on the front line, should be vaccinated? We haven't mandated that. The NHS hasn't mandated that. Um, but we have, you know, a, a huge campaign to make sure that wouldn't as you have many cons- people. I appreciate you're now out of yeah. post now, but yeah. wouldn't you have concerns sending former colleagues into a situation if they've not had their jabs, Gary? Well, I think the important thing is to make sure that, that we offer their jabs, and the vast, vast majority of LAS staff take up those jabs, and they were queuing out the door to, to get them. I so it, it, not a particular problem. There are a small, small number of people for whom, you know, either they don't want to have it for, for specific reasons or actually for medical reasons or whatever. Yeah. But actually, you know, the race really was to get the vaccine out and get people vaccinated as quickly as possible. I can't let you go without putting a question to you that my listeners will be shouting at their radios. LTNs, low traffic neighbourhoods, they have enormous concerns about them. I know that in one borough in Greenwich, Mm. we understand that the LAS has spoken to Greenwich Council about its concerns. Mm. I know the gates, your blokes and women are meant to have keys, but they're also Mm. giant plant pots. You can't lift a plant pot. Come on, you're out of post now. These these could or might have cost lives. Garrett Emerson. I, I don't. Can you say that definitively? I don't know. Might, may, but, but have the, have they delayed responses? Yes, I think in certain situations they have delayed responses um, because you know they they had to be put in very quickly. Uh, they were they were they were put in in a response to a you know a, cha- a massive change in the way uh, we wanted people to live and work their lives. You know, we were at the time you know we were pe- saying to people don't use public transport. You know, get walk and cycle, work from home, and things like that. And you need more space to do that and do that safely. So they were necessary uh, and they were put in incredibly quickly we worked as closely as we could with all of the of the boroughs and tfl were very helpful in that because they did a lot of the coordination um and i have to also say that you know in most cases wherever we raised uh issues or problems with boroughs they were very responsive to doing something about it taking things out uh, and, and so on the biggest you challenge think your blokes and women driving those big ambulances around now were thinking what is the boss on about here well, what what, what, they, what they would be saying to me is that you know i i can i can show you specific instances where i've been delayed uh, and and we know about those and we take them up and respond to them one of the challenges we had was actually getting our staff to report those in on our systems to make sure that we could take them up um and and i think one of the bigger challenges is um it's all right if you know the area but but our crews work all across london and, and actually going into an area of london that they perhaps know less well uh, and relying on satellite navigation that inevitably is not quite up to date because yeah. some new uh, restrictions gone in is where a lot of the problems uh, occur right. i've known you for more than a decade right i can see the passion that you've had for this job come on why leave so unexpectedly and abruptly come on i don't know whether it was unexpected you know it's something that um I, you know i i was very clear when i went into the job that i was going to do a specific job time limited probably in my mind i probably was thinking three three years to to, to do what i had to do i did that we got into a pandemic the question was then then was the right time to leave you know and the health service across the country but in london is going through a significant transformation now uh, and, and really actually it, it, it either needed to be somebody who was going to stay on for another four or five years to take it to the next level, or uh, was that going to be me, or is that going to be somebody else? I think it should be somebody else. I think it probably needs to be somebody who can integrate the organisation further into the NHS in London, because one of the challenges with LAS is that it sat historically quite at the periphery of the NHS, because it lives in three worlds, if you like. It lives in the world of the NHS, it lives in the world of emergency services, which is very different. And of course, it's one of those big public facing mm-hmm. services that, that sort of orbit around City Hall, although it has no direct responsibility to City Hall, you know, with the, you know, the London Resilience Forum, emergency response and so on. We work incredibly closely. Uh, so 
it has to live in those three worlds. And uh, what I hope I've been able to do is to uh, get it more central in those three worlds. But one of the big challenges now is it's got a great opportunity to play a huge role in the centre of planning response and managing urgent emergency care and directing patients right across the healthcare system. And that requires somebody, I think, that can do that within the NHS. Look forward to speaking to you again when you're mayor. Garrett Emerson, <laughs> former chief executive of the London Avenue Service, extended interview on LBC News is next.